This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here, in a grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, there's a warehouse of homicide where everyday objects, a simple glass, a, a piece of rope, a woman's handkerchief, all, all are touched by murder. You take this, this iron bar. It's a familiar object, the handle of a jack. If you own a car, you have a jack handle. Maybe you've used it, but never... Never I trust like this. Gracie, quick, give me the jack handle. Here, let me go. What do you want? I... No, no, don't hit me. Don't, don't. Today, you'll find that jack handle in the Black Museum. of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Museum. A few yards from here, the Thames laps at the riverside of Scotland Yard. But you never know it in here. Not in this long, dim, stone arched room. It's a kind of mecca, a goal to be reached by students of crime and criminology the whole world over. Yes, here in this room. Eyes, death, and the mementos and souvenirs of death on these shelves, in these cabinets, under this well-dusted glass. The weapons, the key clues of every homicide in which Scotland Yard has taken part for almost a hundred years. Now here, in this case, the small white box is from Edinburgh. This death was in this box. Death by poison. The death of a you importunate lover. Now, this tiny pistol, it's oiled, it's in working order. A Derringer, it's called. The killer wore it up his sleeve. One morning at eight o'clock in the British tradition, the trap was sprung. The killer walked on thin air. The executioner received the customary ten pounds. Ah, now, here's something more familiar, a jack handle. It's intriguing. Once according to the case book, yes, that's the story, a tale which begins innocently enough when London lived in the blackout, and many American men found their after-dark amusement in tiny hole-in-the-wall cafes. Think of me always, though we're far apart. Keep a tender memory within... Well, look around, small tables crowded together, not much light. Pretty stuffy, and the blackout curtains, the double blackout door don't help the ventilation much. The girl singing is pretty in a tawdry sort of way, provocative in the manner of a cheap pinup, but the two young men in the American uniforms don't seem to mind. How's about it, Tom? Not bad for a dive? Not too bad. Five will get you ten, it's out of bounds. Yeah, not yet, son. Just open. The MPs haven't cased the joint yet. Oh, good deal. Well, nothing to worry about, kid. Well, who's worried? What can they do? Six months in the stockade, maybe? <laughs> That's okay with me. Apparently, at least one of these gentlemen is over the hill. <laughs> now, their interest has shifted, and quite naturally, of course. You think she has to sing for a living? It can't be much of a living. She's not too bad. Maybe she dates. Ah, uh, you wouldn't know what to do about it if she does. Says who? That <laughs> says me. What were you stateside, anyway? A parson's son or a school teacher? I worked in a bank. So what? I got along. I did all right. Uh, hiding in the army? Hiding in the... Oh, maybe. 
Could be. I get it. Still water runs deep and all that stuff. Now, look, Teddy. What you don't know won't hurt you, see? Does that apply to Gracie? Gracie? You mean the babe? Well, who else? Grace Harwell, the London thrush, who don't sing half as good as she looks. You know her? Well, I met her a couple of times. You want a knockdown? Well, why not? Now? Well, sure. Gracie, let's see your speed, son. You got a ringside seat. Well, pity. The Yank who thought he'd take Soho single-handed. Sit down, Gracie. What'll you have? My regular. Who's your friend? Oh, meet Private Tom Bennett, Gracie Harwell. Hi. Hello, soldier. Let me get your drink, Gracie. Faster that way. Hey, what about your ringside seat? I'll be back in time. That fast you can't work. Uh, Grace? Yeah? How would you like to help me win a bet? <laughs> well, this is a new approach. Good. Now, look, all I need to win is a date with you, see, for tomorrow night. Well, how about it? After the show? You want furlough? Maybe. Maybe not. I'll be in town tomorrow night. Got a car with petrol? No, but I will have. You said it like you meant it. I will have a car and gas. When and where? Well, I'm not saying for sure, but be outside at one o'clock in the morning. You may win your bet. And so, they met. That was the beginning. Next evening, next morning, rather, Tom was at the appointed place, complete with jeep and fuel. Hi, Gracie. Hello, soldier. Come on, climb aboard. Where'd you get it? Let's say I borrowed it. Shall we go? Why not? A boy, a girl, a jeep. In the London blackout without benefit of cherry planes and bombs. A time to relax, to make an impression on the girl. The former bank clerk made his play to the girl who sang club dates on the seamy side of London. It's too bad. No moon tonight. The moon means bombers. At this point, that's not too bad. Oh, that's silly. Oh, look, bombers mean there's a war on. No war, I wouldn't be here. Well, what's good about that, being here? I could itemize. One, I met you. But let's leave it at that. <laughs> you start early. That's the States. Don't waste time. Well, you didn't waste time borrowing the Jeep. What's one Jeep, more or less? I worked in the carpool. I know my way around. You must. You went back to get the car. What are you getting at, sister? The car. It's out without a pass. So are you. Smart girl. I know my way around. Want to sell the Jeep? I know a fellow will give you a good price. No, I need it. What for? Business. What kind of... Look out! That bike! Gee, thanks. Oh. That's no place for a bike this time of night. <laughs> nor the girl on it. What kind of business? I, uh, I have a small problem. Being out without a pass, I don't get paid. Oh. Money's necessary even in wartime. I had my ways back in L.A., mm -hmm. Los Angeles to you. But I need a car. You get it, Gracie? Now, if you'd like a small demonstration, we can... Begin. You know, a man boasts to a girl and decides to make good the boast. This very modern variation on that theme consisted of stopping the jeep side of the road, cutting the engine, waiting. Half amused, half interested, the girl sat quietly as the soldier climbed out of the car and stationed himself in the shadows. Along the road came the bicycle, the girl on it pedaling swiftly, her thoughts a thousand miles away. She drew alongside the parked, half-hidden jeep. Okay, sister, I'll take that bike. <laughs> What's the idea? I've got to get home. I want that bike, do you hear? Oh, I won't get it. Shut up. You want one across the mouth? Oh, no. You leave me alone. You leave me alone. You leave me alone. How was that, Gracie? And she left her bag. There ought to be a left left in it for a couple of beers. So that's the way you do it in L.A.? Yeah. You're all right, Tommy. Only next time, let's crack it for more than the price of a couple of beers. Next time was the next evening, but early, before the bars closed. Gracie, the pin-up said... I won't go to work tomorrow night, and I know a spot off by itself. With a jeep, we can get away fast, like you did it in L.A. And they drove up to the spot, a small pub on a side road, and Gracie said... Let's get to it, Tommy. They've got customers. That means money in the till. But Tommy hesitated, and he said... Too many. Scared? Now, why take chances? There might even be a cop in there. 
Maybe later. You promised. You said I'd be the lookout while you went in and collected. Maybe later, not now. Well, let's do something, Tom. We'll find something. You want a thrill? We'll find something. I drove away, a well-lighted, well-populated pub was not to Tom's liking. He preferred the dark roads, the byways, the lone victims. But Gracie wanted her thrill. Tom found it for her. Hop in, miss. Oh, this is really awfully nice of you. But, Tom... Oh, you wanted a thrill, baby. Well, you'll get it. Where are you headed, miss? Well, out to Kingston, if it's on your way. Yeah, it's on our way. You all set? Let's go. Two girls and a boy racing along the unlighted road toward Kingston. Not much conversation. There never is with a hitchhiker in the car. Tom drove. Gracie waited. River flowed close to the highway. Black glass. Silent in the starlight. What's wrong? I think I have a flat. Oh, I didn't hear him. I said I think I have a flat. Oh. Oh, yes. It, it does feel off a bit. The Jeep, I mean. Felt like the left rear. Can I help? Well, if you'd get out, miss. You can leave your suitcase. The tools are under your seat. Oh, of course. What can I do? I'll need the jack. The handle is on the floor, Gracie. Yeah, I've got it. You, miss. I want your handbag. What? Oh, oh, no. No, no, you keep away from me. Give me that bag. Oh, help, somebody. Help. Oh, no, get away from me. Get away. Let go of my dress. Go on, Tubby. Grab her. Drop her up. No, I won't. I won't. I... I... Gracie, oh. quick, give me the jack handle. Here. Let me go. What do you want? Back, will you? Hit her again, Tommy. Hit her. What for? She's done. We got her stuff. I think she's breathing. So what? Give me a hand. What do we do with her? Into the river. What do you suppose I picked this place for? Get her feet. Stop them. Now, into the drink she goes. Oh, Tom. Tom. Well, did you get a thrill out of that, baby? That's the way we do it in L.A. Knock them over and dump them someplace where they won't be found. Okay, let's get going, Gracie. We got places to go and things to do tonight. Nice, clean fun. The end of that night's work was a jack handle. A jack handle. It lies today in the Black Museum. Just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Continue with the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. It was to be some time before the jack handle came to rest in the Black Museum. A trail of blood and misadventure was yet to be blazed through wartime London. Tom and Grace were amateurs at crime like this. But they knew enough to cover their tracks. They ditched the jeep, parking it in a rub street. They took cover during daylight... But night and the blackout were their cloak as they prowl for further victims. I'm sick of walking. Does my lady want her limousine? I want a ride. Do you hear, Tommy boy? I hear. Come on, we'll duck into this vestibule. Something will be along. Give me a kiss. Oh, you never have enough. Haven't kissed a babe in a doorway since L.A. Mmm, good. What's that in your pocket? This? You like it? Shell in the chamber, full clip. Where'd you get it? Army stores, Natch. Pretty? Throw it away. Are you kidding? Do you know what they give you for carrying a pistol in this country? Well, what's the difference? We killed that dame, didn't we? They take us, it's the chair anyway. Well, over here, it's the rope. At eight o'clock in the morning. I'm cold, Tommy. I'm cold. You cold? Baby, you're the warmest thing in London. What's that, a car? Must be. Come on. 
Throw the pistol away. You want to ride, don't you? Hey, driver, give us a lift. He's stopping for us. An obliging fellow, isn't he? Where to, Yank? Your way, towards Shepherd's Bush. My girl's got kind of tired of walking. This is awfully nice of you. I'm a taxi, you know. Driving car with hack prices. I'll have to charge you for the ride. Well, we don't mind, do we, honey? We got plenty of money. Hop in. In the back. Private car with hack license. Driver James Carter. Direction east. Through the blackouts. The blue shaded headlights barely glowing in the gloom. After a little distance. Driver, we've changed our minds. How much would it cost me to go a little way further? Out as far as Shepherd's Bush. Driver Carter obliged. It was his job. Pick up passengers, deliver them through the blackout wherever they wanted to go for a price. A living of sorts. Driver Carter thought of it as a living. It's plenty deserted out here. The Jerry's did a thorough job out this way. It's near the docks, isn't it? I suppose so. Well, it's a good place. Perfect. You think he's got any money? All right, driver, stop here. Yes, sir. Nothing here but the rubble. You heard me stop. You know what this is? Service pistol. You hold it, Gracie. Got it. Now don't move, driver. She's got an itchy finger. It, you can have my wallet. Keep him covered, Gracie, while I open the front door. Give me back the gun. Hurry, Tom. All right, you. Driver, get out. On this side. Uh, you can have a car, too. Just leave me alone. Gracie, did you ever see the hole a forty-five makes in a man? No, Tommy. Never. No, Dad! <sighs> Big enough to put your fist through in the back where it came out. Let's toss him in the rubble. That'll do it. Now we can ride anywhere you want to go. It doesn't take much to kill a man. You pull the trigger. The firing pin strikes the cartridge. The powder explodes. And the bit of lead tears into the man. That's all. Nothing left but a few chemicals. Which once were living flesh. A few rags of clothing. Toss it into the rubble. Dust to dust. the warring city. The sun touches the rubble. The sun moves warmly over the cold rubble over the dead. The night watchers start home. The fire wardens, weary but relieved after a quiet night, take a shortcut toward their breakfasts and a few hours sleep. Margie. Hey, what's that? Body, seems like. This area was cleared out months ago. He's fresh, that one. Yeah, let's have a look, shall we? They had their look. It wasn't pleasant. Shot! Through the chest. Stay here. I'll find a call box. The fire warden placed his call. He rang straight through to Scotland Yard. A short while later, a man picked up the telephone on his desk. Inside the Greystone building on the Thames. Inspector Mason here. Sergeant Davis, sir. Go ahead, Sergeant. The body found in the East End, sir, shot to death. Large caliber from the size of the wound. Probably a service pistol. Uh -huh. Identified as yet? The identity papers are still on him, sir. James Carter, taxi driver, private car registration, tag number RD7445. Uh -huh. The car? No sign of it, sir. Tire marks in the road. It's a thoroughly bombed area, sir. Very little traffic. Uh, another one. Very well. Send out the usual teletype. Description of the car. You know, check for relations, friends of the deceased. Well, that's all we can do for now. Routine. The teletype to all police stations. The constables memorize the details where they go on patrol. London is a big, sprawling city. The blackout isn't any help. That's all for now. The wheels have begun to turn. Routine, inexorable, never ending. And so, another telephone call. Constable Gray, Inspector. Yes? Ladbrook Station. 
I believe I have the car that was posted this morning. Uh -huh. RD7445, black sedan. It's parked in Bush Mules. Yeah. That's a dead end, sir. It's facing out. Oh, very good, Grace. Stand by. We'll be along shortly. A sharp-eyed constable on the blackout, the park car. Routine. Inexorable. Inevitable. Cut your engine, Sergeant. This will do it. Yes, sir. Usual routine. If there's an attempt to drive out, turn on your headlights. The driver will be blinded. Very good, sir. Gray. Constable Gray. Yes, sir. Inspector Mason, CID. Anything yet? Uh, no, sir, not yet. There's a pinhole in the blackout curtain. Second story window of the house behind the car. There was a light up there. Mm hmm. Yeah, nothing now. It went out a moment ago, sir. I'd take post behind the car, Gray. Accost anyone who approaches it. The area's covered. There'll be no escape. Yes, sir. The constable's footsteps fade and stop. Silence. Darkness. The trap is set. They wait. No movement, no sound. Not even the glow of a cigarette. Just darker shadows in the darkness. In the depths of the little muse, a door opens and closes. Footsteps briefly. Two pairs of footsteps. A car door opens. And Constable Gray calls out. Don't start the engine there. You're under arrest. Sergeant, your lights. Tommy, the coppers. They got us boxed. Gray, you won't take me. Hold him, Gray. Got him, sir. <laughs> you got nothing on me. Never mind that. It's my duty to inform you that you're under arrest. You'll be charged with murder. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. You can't prove anything. Run the rule on him, Constable. Yes, sir. Uh, this, sir, service pistol. Oh, good enough. Take them along. All right, you two. Don't touch me. I'll go along. He made me go with him. He threatened me with a pistol. He made me go along. That was her cry. All through the trial which followed swiftly. That was the plea of the tawdry little pin-up from the seamy side of London. He made me do it. He hit me, showed me his pistol. He made me do it. What are the robberies, the cheap, shilling-sized robberies? Yes, I took that girl's purse. I went through the driver's wallet before, before we left his body, but he made me do it. You've got to believe me. He made me do it. <laughs> There were other far less hysterical witnesses, men who spoke with a calm certainty of truth. There was the ballistics expert. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt. The bullet which killed James Carter, the driver of that hired car, uh, was found in the flooring of the car. We have compared it with test bullets fired from the pistol found on the accused. The rifling marks are identical. The death bullet was fired from that pistol. Tom Bennett, accused of murder, wanted for desertion by the United States Army, Former bank clerk. He played his role defiantly. I tell you, she's framing me. This whole deal was her idea. You should have seen the bang she got when she watched what was going on. Now she's trying to pass the buck to me. And with customary thoroughness, Scotland Yard turned up a surprise witness. Yes, those are the two. She gave him the jack handle and he hit me with it. They threw me in the river. The lorry driver found me. I know them anywhere. He made me go along. He made me... I'll prove it. I'll show you where we left the jeep. The jack handle's still in it. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, my lord. Let the prisoners face the jury. What is your verdict? We find both defendants guilty of murder and add a recommendation of mercy for the female prisoner. Oh, yes, juries behave somewhat strangely at times. This one was impressed with a plea of compulsion, but not 
quite enough, it seems, to acquit Grace Harwell. Thus, it came about in due course that the judge pronounced the sentence. Thomas Bennett, you have been found guilty of murder. The sentence of the court is that you be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And then may the Lord have mercy on your soul. On Grace Harwell, the judge pronounced the same terrible sentence. But the jury's recommendation for mercy led the Home Secretary to commute this to penal servitude for life. A lifetime for Grace Harwell to remember. He made me go along. He made me go along. No, Jack Handel. It lies today in the Black Museum. So much for the story of Grace and Tom. Tom's life ended on the scaffold. The life of Grace Harwell continues in the drab monotony of Holloway Prison. The service pistol, of course, and the jack handle remain in their places, their special places of honor, on a shelf in that curious room which is known in Scotland Yard as the Black Museum. And now, until next time, till we meet again in the same place, and I tell you another story of the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. <laughs>